I'm doing this right. Okay, let me see if I'm, all right, yeah, okay. I don't wanna cut my head off. Um, got my coffee here. We are in chapter 18 of Ezekiel. I hope you read it. Told you to last week, I think. And uh, I, I, one of my classes, I finished it last week. One of the classes I got halfway through and one of the classes I just started it. Evidently this was the, I just started it class and I thought it was the I finished it class. But hey, we'll take what we can get. This is one of the more important, I don't know if it's more important, I shouldn't say that, one of the more relevant to today chapters. Because a lot of the chapters, it's him predicting what's going to happen to Jerusalem and prophecies and things that were relevant for them. But this chapter, he rebukes a false doctrine and a false idea that they had. Well, actually, he rebukes several. And those ideas are still prevalent to this day. Those ideas are still being taught in Christianity by insane people today. And so we're going to go and look at chapter 18. We read it last week, and now we're going to talk about it today. First of all, the outline. There's a proverb that they were murmuring about sour grapes. Remember, the parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Okay, so basically what's that proverb saying? It's saying... Um, our parents, our ancestors sinned, and we're being punished for it. We're being punished for our father's uh, sin. Now, what church or group teaches that idea to this day? Well, the Roman Catholic Church. It teaches that you inherit your father's sin, uh, the doctrine of original sin, which is the original doctrine of Calvinism that leads to all its stupidity. And so uh, Augustine, the bishop of of Hippo, a guy from Northern Africa, who was a well-known theologian uh, in Middle Eastern, uh, in, uh, not Middle Eastern, but uh, in the Middle Ages, he wrote about original sin, pushed it off on the Catholic Church, got the church to accept it, and then a guy named John Calvin comes along, hundreds of years later, is a big fan of his, and quotes all his writings and quotes him more than anyone else the number one guy i mean dozens and dozens of times he quotes um this guy and so really um calvinism is augustinism because the ideas that john calvin extrapolates were originally augustine's and he quotes augustine so john's saying i'm not making up anything new i'm just saying what augustine taught and uh, sometimes Augustine is quoted where he'll have a good quote, and he does have a couple good quotes because a stop clock's right twice a day. But Augustine was a guy who had been caught up in several cults before he became a Christian and brought those cult ideas and Eastern ideas into the church and perverted the doctrine of Christianity uh, irreparably in the Catholic Church and in much of Protestantism that's uh, influenced by what John Calvin's theology is called reformed theology. Well, it's it's not reformed, it's deformed, and it was deformed by Augustine, and it's not good theology. And chapter 18 here is going to um, kill it. Uh, it's going to knock it up one side and down the other. And so multiple things in Calvinism is going to be refuted here. The first concept, uh, the, the T of the tulip, if you've ever studied Calvinism, they, they give an acrostic, it's the word tulip, and the T stands for the doctrine of total depravity. And the idea of total depravity, that you're born totally depraved and can't do anything good until the Holy Spirit comes and zaps you with faith, that idea comes from the idea of original sin. If you didn't believe in original sin, you couldn't believe in total depravity. The, way, the reason you're born totally depraved is because Adam and Eve sinned and you inherit their sin, which is, of course, preposterous. Because... Even if you did inherit your parents' sin, right? Let's say I inherited Adam and Eve's sin. How did I get it from my mom and dad when they were already Christians by the time I was born? If they were redeemed and the curse was taken off of them, how is it I got it when I was born? And so, you know, they don't even make sense in and of themselves. And how, how did Jesus not get it? Well, he was virgin born. Okay, well then how did Mary not get it? And so the whole thing is just preposterous. And, uh, and in fact, the Catholics were asked that question, and what they came up with is Mary was uh, uh, immaculately conceived, and she was perfect. And that's why they say she was sinless, and that's why they pray to her and worship her. And so they've just made a god and a goddess 
to replace the gods and goddesses of the Europeans. And um, in fact, you go to Mexico, you're going to see Guadalupe and Mary interchangeable. And, and that's because they've just paganized uh, forms of Christianity and called it Christianity when it's not. And so these false doctrines that you inherit your parents' sin or you're guilty before God of sins before you're born is just totally against Ezekiel chapter 18, as we're going to see. But that's the thing that they're quoting, is that the father ate our grapes. Now, is that true? If, um, if before my kids were born... I ate a bunch of sugar and my teeth rotted. When my kids are born, are they going to be born with rotten teeth? No. A parent eating sour grapes does not set the, teeth, the kid's teeth on edge. It's not true in the real world. And it's not true in the allegory world either. In the spiritual world. And what it's supposed to allegorize. It's a false proverb. It's not true. The parents do not eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. It doesn't work that way. Okay? So the truth of God is illustrated. He says the soul that sins shall die. He says it three times. It's the soul who sins is the one who's going to die. Not you're, you're going to die because of your parents' sin. But the soul who sins is the one who will die. He says the righteous man shall live. If a guy does what's right before God, he'll live. A wicked man, he'll die. And his blood will be on his own head. And this is the righteous son of a wicked man shall live. But the wicked father shall die. So the sons of the father are not held against the son, and the sins of the son are not held against the father. And then he, he summarizes that in verses 19 through 20. Then he gives a further explanation of how he deals with Israel. He says, the repentant man shall live. Not only is a guy who sees his father's sins and doesn't do them, will he live, even though his father was wicked? If a man is wicked and he sees his own ways are wicked and he repents and stops doing wrong and starts trying to do right, God will forgive him. God will forgive the repentant man. And then God says, if a guy's a righteous person and he backslides and he goes back to sin and stops being repentant, he'll die. And in the one case, he said, all the guy's sins, the repentant man, all his sins will be forgiven and, and forgotten. And then it says the righteous man who turns from righteousness and turns back to sin, it says to him, all the righteous things he ever did will be forgotten. So if you're a sinner who repents, God forgets all your sin. And if you're a Christian who backslides, God forgets all your good deeds. And that's what he's teaching. And then the rule is defended in verse 20. Because they were saying, well, that's not fair. God says, I'm fair. I'm more than fair. If I was totally fair, you wouldn't have a chance. <laughs> you know, I'm more than fair. And then by avoiding sin, uh, he calls them repentance. Avoid sins that require your life. Acquire a new heart and a new spirit. You can get a new heart and new spirit. Remember David's prayer when he repented of his sin in Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Uh, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Renew a right spirit within me. See, we need a new spirit and a new heart. And God, if we'll repent, God will give us that. Now notice, Calvinism said God comes, zaps you, gives you a new heart, and then you repent. And have faith. Where this says you have faith, believe in God, and then you repent because of that faith. And then because of that, he gives you a new heart and a new spirit. See, Calvinism always gets the order wrong. The way we know Calvinism isn't right is it gets the order wrong. Always look at the order of salvation in the Bible and compare it to the order of salvation with Calvinism. They're always backwards. Calvinism gets the order wrong. So uh, be aware God does not want... Uh, to require your life. He doesn't want to kill you. God doesn't take pleasure in sending anybody to hell. Now, he'll do it, but he never likes it. He doesn't take any pleasure. He doesn't want you to go to hell. Turns out, just like the New Testament says, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should turn to repentance, right? God doesn't want to send anybody to hell. I don't care how bad they've been. You know, I don't care if they're Murderers, child molesters, prostitutes, drug addicts, Justin Bieber fans. I don't care how bad they are. He wants to forgive them of whatever, of whatever they want, and, but they got to repent. Okay? So, start looking at the verses. The people felt that they were in captivity because of Manasseh's sins. Now, Manasseh was one bad dude, and he had sinned, 
And so they thought, well, all these bad things are happening because of Manasseh. It's all Manasseh's fault. You know, he had done evil, therefore they were in captivity. The proverb amounts to this. The fathers have sinned and the children are paying for it. In this chapter, he refutes this false proverb and illustrates the way of his dealings and refutation of the false doctrines of original sin and total depravity. You see, the Bible says, all sin because, I, I, I mean, uh, all die because all sin. It doesn't say all die because Adam sinned. It does say that sin came into the world through Adam. That's how sin came into the world. And that's how death came into the world. But everyone dies, not because Adam sinned, but because we sin. We're always trying to absolve ourselves of responsibility by blaming it on somebody else. You go back to Adam and Eve. Eve blamed Satan, and Adam blamed God. Well, this woman you gave me, gave you this. What's he saying? If you hadn't given me this woman, I wouldn't have sinned. It's your fault, God. Shouldn't give me this woman. See, everybody was blaming somebody else for their sin. And that's what we like to do. Well, my dad was an alcoholic. Well, I was raised in a non Christian home. Well, my parents were too strict and too hard on me, and I never had any freedom. They made me go to church all the time, you know. And everybody wants to blame their parents or society or everyone else. Well, how many times have I sat there counseling a couple? Well, I wouldn't have cheated on her if she'd given me more sex. Or I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have cheated on him if he'd have met my emotional needs, but he never wanted to talk to me or listen to me. So I found some guy at work. Everybody wants to find an excuse for their sin. Remember Billy Joel's song from the 80s? We didn't start the fire. It's been always burning since the world's been turned. And he goes through all this history of stuff. What's he saying? It wasn't our fault. We didn't make the world this way. We inherited it. Well, we may not have started the fire. That may have been Adam and Eve. But we threw another log on it. We stoked the flames. And we... Yeah, that is in that song. It is too. Throw another log on the fire. Okay, all right. Know, know your country music, people. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, Jake's not here to say a crazy thing, so Chris is filling in the slot for me. <laughs> um, so that's, he refutes this proverb of original sin and total depravity. See, he's saying the problem isn't that Manasseh sinned. If just the king Manasseh had sinned and the rest of the country were good, righteous people, God had just struck Manasseh dead. But it turns out the problem with the whole country What's the whole country? And how much more in our country? You know, we can blame the leaders. Well, Trump this, or, well, Biden that. Well, I remember Abraham Lincoln saying it's a government by the people, for the people, of the people. I think the persons, the people to blame are us. And if the country's going to hell in the handbasket, we chose it. We allowed it. And the only way bad people can rule over good people is if good people aren't there to stop them. The only way bad people can rule over people is if the people they're ruling over are bad too. Because good people don't get ruled over by bad people. They run them out. Good people stand up. Good people, good people are, are liberated by God from bad leaders. It's bad people who end up under the thumb of tyrants. For a generation or two. Until they repent. And then when they repent. God raises up someone to deliver them. And we've seen it again and again in the Bible. And we see it again and again in history. And if we got bad leaders. The cure. Is not a political revolution. The cure is a spiritual revival. <coughs> what we need is repentance. In our personal life. In our churches. In our country. In every other way. The thing that's needed today. Is repentance. The thing that's not there, that needs to be there, is repentance. And so we repent. Don't expect things to get better. Expect them to go from bad to worse. Expect to jump out of the frying pan and into the fire until there's repentance. It's just not going to get better. Because God's going to ratchet it up, ratchet it up, ratchet it up until we repent. He's done that with every other country in human history. He's not. We aren't some special exception. And he does it to his church. It start, in fact, he starts with the church, as we'll see. So in 2 Kings 21, uh, 2 Kings 23, Chronicles 33, we can see who is to blame. Just Manasseh? 
No, or all of Judah. Yeah. See, the problem wasn't just Manasseh. Yeah, Manasseh was a wicked leader, but he was allowed to be a wicked leader by wicked people. And so uh, I, I think leaders are a reflection of a people. God gives you the leader you deserve. And we need to be praying for leaders that are better than we deserve. Um, so the original sin is a lie. Okay? Now, here's the proof text. Now, I've, when I do my Calvinism class, which um, if you're dealing with people who are Calvinists, I highly recommend you get my notes and, and lectures on Calvinism from Summit and watch them. I don't necessarily suggest you show them these notes and lectures because I'm not nice. <laughs> Uh, in the, I mean, I really tear it apart because I'm teaching Christians who don't believe in Calvinism. And so, although I did have, I did have one guy who showed it to a Calvinist and it worked. He's like, well, I guess I don't believe that anymore, but I, I'm pretty vicious. Um, I'm not, I'm not nice or tactful. Uh, I don't beat around the bush. Uh, if I was talking to a Calvinist, I would be much more uh, gentle in my approach because I just kind of end up mocking because it's so patently stupid. Um, and I want to really convince the Christians that I'm talking to that don't believe in Calvinism to never become Calvinists. And so I show how utterly evil, wicked, stupid, and totally false it is. And uh, which I guess I'm doing now and I'm saying all these things right on Facebook. <laughs> Can we edit this, Jake, this part? Um, so anyway, uh, they use this passage as their, one of their proof texts. This is one of their main proofs that you inherit your father's sin, okay? You want to ask, well, why do you think that? Well, there's a couple verses, and I'm not going to deal with all the verses why they believe in original sin. But I'm dealing with this one because this is one that the Jews had at the time that's not from the New Testament. It's from the Old Testament. And it's one that the people who, who quoted this proverb, the parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, they would have used this as their proof text. These people with false theological ideas that Ezekiel is dealing with, they would have used this as their proof text, as Calvinists do today. So I want to deal with this one. Um, this is from Exodus 10. Uh, actually, that, that's not right. It might be 10.5. Could somebody look that up for me? I don't think that, that verse is right. Um, it might be 10.5 or maybe it's 9.5. I don't think that's right. Okay, it's definitely not right. Okay, so if somebody finds that, you get a bonus point for the night. You get extra brownie in there. Literal brownie that's right in there. Uh, okay, so you shall bow down to them, or you shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So this is their excuse for you see, you inherit your parents' sins. See, look what it says. God will punish the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Yeah, they'll read verse 5, but then they won't read verse 6, which says, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So if that which proves too much doesn't prove anything, right? So anybody find it? Because you're all still digging around. So. It's not actually, it's not 10-5. Is it 9-5? Look at 9-5. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Exodus 25. 25, thank you. 20, verse Chapter 20, 20, verse 5. Verse 5, okay, thank you. I'm going to fix that right now because um, if I don't, I won't. Let's, uh, let's get that right, shall we? Okay. Oh, look, it's right. I don't know what you guys are talking about. Okay. Uh, so he's saying, uh, and punish the children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me. So if that means that a, a sinful person, their, their kids are held to a third, look, I'm way beyond three or four generations from Adam. So how can I be held accountable for Adam's sins? And I've had Christians in my past who were, were right with God and who are my ancestors, so why aren't I a part of the a thousand generation? See, this isn't talking about 
the, the curse of sin or going to hell. This is talking about the physical consequences of bad choices. Okay? So let's illustrate it. Okay? Let's say a guy's a drunk. What are some bad things that might happen to his family because he's a drunk? You can abused. shout him out. Huh? He's abused. Okay, so they might be abused physically, <clears throat> emotionally. He might beat him, get angry. What else might a drunk dad uh, cause problems for his kids? Financial. Financial, can't keep a job, so they're always living in poverty. Okay, what else? A divorce. Okay, so he, he does get along with mom, and so they split up. And we know that a divorce has a recidivism. If you're divorced, you're more likely to be divorced. If you're a drinker, you're more likely to, your dad is a drinker, you're more likely to what? Be a drunk. So he might set a bad example, and they might have drinking issues or other instability. So is it what else? He could end up killing one of his family if he's drunk when he's driving. Okay, so he's drinking and driving, they could be in a car wreck. So those things are consequences of sin. Now, let's say there's a drunk, and he's got a five-year-old kid, real innocent, wonderful little kid. He grew up in poverty. <clears throat> the mom ran off. Because dad was a drunk and she was scared of him and he beat her. And he beats the kid and the kid has all these problems. And then dad gets in a car wreck drinking and driving and the little kid dies. Does he go to hell? No. No. Now, did, were there consequences for his dad's sin? Yeah, affected the kid. There were consequences. But was there a curse on the kid? Did he go to hell? No. See, there's a difference between consequences and a curse. And then people are like, yeah, I've just got this generational curse. Look, there's no such thing. There's consequences because you you might have a generational poverty because poor people tend to have poor people. And they, you didn't inherit anything from your dad, so you're starting off in poverty, and you don't have the education and the opportunities that another person had whose dad wasn't a drunk. But you didn't inherit their sin. And this is talking about consequences. Let's use another example. Let's look at Abraham. Abraham goes down to Egypt. His wife is good looking, and he's afraid Pharaoh's going to kill him because his wife's so attractive so he could marry his wife. So what's he do? He lies and says his wife is his sister. Now, so he sins and he lies. Uh, almost gets her married off to Pharaoh, causes all kinds of problems, but he does that. Now, what's his son Isaac do years later? Same thing. Well, then his wife Rebecca sees, well, lying seems to work. And so when he wants to give the blessing to the oldest son, he likes Esau instead of Jacob, the one God told her would be blessed. What she do? She gets Jacob to lie to his dad about the uh, who he was, so he gets the blessing. And then he has to run off, and he runs off to cousin, Uncle Laban, I mean. And what's Laban do when he goes to marry a girl? He lies to him and gives him the wrong... I mean, that's the cruelest thing of all. Like, wake up with the ugly sister the day after. The Bible said she had weak eyes. I don't know if that was cross-eyed or what. But she... Tear out of her right eye went down her left cheek. She had a face. Everything looked good but her face. <laughs> well, he, it is cruel. He lies. Now then, he has 12 kids. And he favors one of them. And what's the, what, what's the boys do to dad about the favorite brother? What do they do? They lie, and they all, end, and then he goes down to Egypt, and they all end up down there in Egypt. And what happens in Egypt? They all end up what? Slaves. So his whole ancestry ends up slaves in Egypt because he went once upon a time to Egypt and lied. You see how there's consequences to the third and the fourth generation? Right? But did Abraham just do that one sin? Is that all Abraham ever did? What else did Abraham do? Yeah, he, he put his faith in God and offered his son Isaac on the altar, became the father of the faithful. And did, did Isaac believe in God and repent? Did Jacob repent? Yeah. Did Joseph? Were, were there godly people? Did they go to, Yeah. So that by the time that they finally, there's an ancestry for the Messiah to come into the world. Did the Messiah come into the world? No. It wasn't a thousand generations later. You know, but, you know, 24 generations, or however much it was. Uh, did that affect us today? <clears throat> to uh, generations and generations later? Does Abraham's faith affect us today? Yeah. We're all children of Abraham through faith, the New Testament teaches. So does it go to a thousand Does his faithfulness go to a thousand generations? Yeah. 
So are there some short-term consequences if you sin on your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids? Yes. But if you come to faith and put your faith in God, there, there'll be good consequences for a thousand generations. What that's teaching us is there's a snowball effect to sin. But the snowball effect of sin is not as strong and not as powerful as the snowball effect of faith. Faith is bigger than your sin. And mercy triumphs over judgment. And when you turn to God in faith, it not only uh, brings about salvation for you, it's going to have effects and consequences in other people greater than anything you ever did wrong. And the greatest effect you can have in your life is not your sin. The greatest effect you can have in your life, if you will, if you'll have faith, is your belief in God and your righteousness. And the long-term consequences of your good deeds are far greater than the long-term consequences of your bad deeds. That's what Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, is saying. But they don't read verse 6, do they? Because when you want to find a proof text, you don't read the stuff around it. You take it out of context, and you make it about heaven and hell, not about earthly consequences. You know, if you go out and you shoot up and you do drugs and you destroy your body or you smoke cigarettes and destroy your lungs or you drink alcohol and destroy your liver, if you repent, you can be forgiven and go to heaven, but your body still bears the scars of that. Right. If you've shot up all the time, you'll still have scars and tracks on your arm for the rest of your life. Your lungs will still have junk in them if you smoke for the rest of your life. And there's going to be con physical consequences of your sin. They're going to last until Jesus comes back and gives you a new body. That's why we got to get a new body. Because we got to get this body is cursed and dying, and, and he's going to raise us up in new bodies that aren't made of the stuff of this earth and everything that's passed away, but of the new heaven and the new earth. We're getting new bodies that are eternal. That don't, it, he's not just going to get rid of the spiritual scars and the emotional scars when he wipes the tears from your eye. He's going to get rid of the physical results. You're going to get a whole new body that's innocent, like a never sinned body. And you're going to have a perfect body in a world without any sin, where no evil thing enters. He's going to totally put us in a new, totally regenerated. Right now, inwardly, we're renewed day by day, but outwardly, we're wasting away. I just turned 50 on the 10th. I'm getting older. My back hurts every time I think about it. But we're getting older, but... The day's coming when we get the upgrade, you know, Kindle 2.0. And that one won't have any physical problems. And that's what we're looking forward to. And so this is talking about consequences. So when you say, uh, the, can a father's sins negatively affect his family? Yes. But not whether they go to heaven or hell. Not whether they live or die spiritually. Well, how do we know it's talking about spiritual in Ezekiel? Because what's he say? He says, he doesn't say the, the body will die. He says the soul who sins will die. Talk about the second death. It's talking about hell. The soul who sins is the one who dies. And you will not go to hell for what your dad did. And you will not go to heaven for what your dad did. You can't go to heaven or hell based on your parents' relationship with God. You have to have your own relationship with God. And you have to repent. If a man is a drunk, he may have short-term temporary negative consequences on his children, but he won't condemn the child to eternal spiritual punishment in hell. If a man is sober, he may have short-term temporary positive consequences on his child's life, but it will not secure eternal spiritual blessings in heaven for that child. Christians can have children who turn away from God and don't end up saved. Who your parents are can be a great blessing or it can be a great, it can be a really bad thing, but it doesn't determine your eternal destiny. Turns out that's your choice. Now, when you're a little, you're five-year-old, you might be a brat because your parents were no good. But by the time you're 15, you know right from wrong. Your conscience has spoke. By the time you're 20, it's time to stop blaming mom and dad. You've got to take responsibility for your choices and who you are. You have to look at it and go, okay, what's right and what's wrong? And that's a choice we have to make. So know the difference between eternal and temporary consequence for sin. So how does God judge? Well, look at verse 3 and 4. He wants a proverb stopped. 
He is not only sovereign over all men, Father and Son alike. He is the judge. The soul who sins, he shall die. I don't have to judge the Son by the Father. I, I can judge each soul individually. I'm the God of everyone. And the soul who sins is the one who will die. That's what God says. So I can't go to hell for what Adam did. Thank God. Adam may have brought it into the world. Adam may have started it. But I'm responsible for my own actions. I'm responsible. So verses 5 through 9. It gives the attributes of a righteous and just man. This man shall live. Pa, he's just, he's lawful, he's righteous, he shares. We read all of those last week. Hopefully you read them before you came today. And then he gives the negative. Avoid pagan ritual, avoid sexual sin, avoid greed, fraud, robbery, usury, false weights, bribery. Um, by the way, I, I think it's interesting that one of the things that Ezekiel is constantly rebuking is taking interest on the poor. Um, if I could, I would outlaw every check to cash place I could find. I would outlaw these credit cards. I would outlaw these uh, rent to own places. All they are is excessive interest on the poor. It's, it's a way to take advantage of the poor and it's a grievous evil in my opinion. Uh, and uh, the Bible condemns it again and again and again and again. And it's just wrong. Um, so that's how God judges. So who lives and dies? Well, the son that is opposite of the righteous man, he's a thief, murderer, unlawful, idolater, fornicator, oppressor of the unfortunate, the greedy, he shall die even though he was the son of a righteous man. And a righteous son of an unrighteous father shall live even if he's not like his father. However, the wicked father of a righteous son shall die. The Jews marveled at this and said, why does not the son reap the sin of the father? And God says, no. Not if he repents and lives right now. If you've got a drunk daddy, that doesn't mean you can't be an awesome Christian. You came from a bad parenting. You know, I sat and talked to a preacher just a few weeks ago. And um, his dad was a drunk. And his and his mom, and, and, and when he brought home a Bible at 17 years old, his dad threw it out of the house and said, you can't read that in this house. And his dad did everything to keep him from becoming a Christian. His mom, he was abusive. Him and his mom were constantly cheating and drunk and drugs and all kinds of stuff. And he just grew up in a terrible home. And then after his mom died and his dad's on his deathbed, he finds out that his dad wasn't his dad. That she'd had an affair with his friend. And he knew who that guy was. And that guy, he didn't have any respect for. And his dad was a pedophile. An admitted pedophile. And just a terrible guy who drank himself to death. How would you like to find out that that's who your biological father was? And yet, and he's like, I just wish I'd had a good Christian father. It's like, there's a lot of people with good Christian fathers that turned out to be rats. You love God, and you've got the best father of all your heavenly father. And I, it stinks sometimes to get to get a bad earthly father, and I feel for people who've gone through that. But you don't have to have the best earthly parent to be righteous. You don't have to have the perfect mom or the perfect dad. You can come from really bad, wicked people and still be a great Christian. Because who your parents are doesn't necessarily mean that's who you'll be. Now, do they, could you inherit certain tendencies? Yes. If your parent's a hothead, could that be genetic? Yeah. Could you inherit, inherit the tendency to be a, a, an impatient hothead? Yes. But do you have to be an, in, an impatient hothead just because you have that temptation? No. And we all inherit some kind of bad tendencies. Which one of us was tempted to sin? And just because... Uh, you know, your parent had one particular sin and not another doesn't mean you've got to do it. You don't have to be like your parents. You can have great parents. You don't got to be like them. I've known many people who had great parents and were nothing like them. Have you ever seen somebody, two uh, brothers and sisters, grew up in the exact same home, the exact same parents, and you go, how did they turn out so different? And one of them will have one idea of what the parents were like, and the other one will have another idea of what the parents were like. And they'll be just like, what world did you grow up in? What house did you... How did that happen? Because people make choices. Because ultimately, it's not your genetics, and it's not your conditioning, or your nurturing, or your parenting that determines who you finally are. Turns out, 
one who determines who you finally become as an adult is you and the choices you decide to make. And that's what this is teaching. The true principle is reaffirmed. The soul that sins, he shall die. And the soul who repents, he shall be saved. Neither the son nor the father pays for the other sins. Each bears its own responsibility for God. Men do not change. Uh, excuse me. Men do change. Man has free will to change. God does forgive and forget. And he lets repentant men live. God has no pleasure in the death of a wicked person. He is not willing that men should perish. One cannot get ahead of schedule and rest on his laurels. He must remain faithful or be condemned. So on the one hand, if you uh, turn from your, your sin to righteousness... He'll forget your sin. But if you turn from righteousness to sin, he'll forget your righteousness. I don't care if you, some of you all, you've been Christians for a while. And you might, might go, well, I've done my thing. I've won this many people. I've worked in the church. I've taught my Sunday school. I've done my, I've done my part. And you might say, well, now I can just sin a little bit. Don't let your wicked heart think that you've somehow done enough righteous things for God that now you can do some wicked things. That's like the Catholics who thought, if I give money to St. Paul's Cathedral, I can buy an indulgence. I can cheat on my wife because I gave this money to the church. And they counterbalance in the scales. And God doesn't judge like that. And that idea is proven false here too. It turns out the only people going to heaven are the repentant. And if you're not repentant when you die, you're toast. You're going down. And the question is not, have you sinned? You all have. And so have I. The question is, have you repented? The question is, did your parents sin or did Adam sin? Yeah, they did. The question is, did you repent of your sin? That's what matters. That's what's important. Only unfair to God who has to pay. They're like, well, that's not fair. Well, one it was unfair to is Jesus. And he willingly chose to do it out of love. The only one who gets a raw deal from Christianity is Jesus. Everybody else gets the opportunity of a lifetime. Verses 25 to 29. Men saw this as unfair of God. It is a man that is all messed up in his thinking. See, when you start saying God's unfair, you are messed up. When you start going, I just don't think God's being fair here. You really need to check yourself before you wreck yourself because your, your, th your thinking is wrong. When you start questioning whether God is fair, you're in a bad, bad place. Get your head right. Go read some scripture. Go talk to somebody because you're off base. Because there's one thing God isn't. That's unfair. If the righteous man changes, his righteousness is forgotten. God does not judge the son by the father. God does not judge the father by the son. The whole idea of original sin and total depravity is totally eliminated. And what else is eliminated here? What other part of Calvinism? Once they make that the I'm sorry? Once saved, always saved. Yeah, once saved, always saved. It's thrown right out the window here, isn't it? Because you can be righteous and then fall away according to this. So that once shaved, always shaved <laughs> stuff, uh, that's, that's false. That's not true. That um, eternal security... Total lie. Okay? So that's false. And what else? The thing that says that that's um, irreversible grace? That's, that's wrong. The, the idea that um, you don't choose, that God chooses? That's wrong. This squarely says you choose. Look what he says. There's no need for anyone to die. He will forgive you if you repent. He will give you a new heart and a new spirit. And he doesn't want you to perish. So repent, repent. Whose choice does he put it in? Whose lap does he put it in? Ours. You need to repent. I don't want you to die. Please, please repent. You see, that totally undoes the rest of Calvinism. And so this idea that you don't choose, that God chooses you, and that you get zapped and against your will come to faith and repentance against your will, all of those ideas of Calvinism, Ezekiel H., chapter 18, just annihilates. I don't know any better concise refutation of the evil doctrine of Calvinism than Ezekiel chapter 18. And God says, that's not going to be said among my people. So what's that mean? 
if people are saying it, they're not his people. They're Satan's people. Charges uh, we made against God in our own perverted our, our own perverted thinking. When you start blaming God, you are under the influence of the devil. That's that's what devil got Adam and Eve to do. Take responsibility. You did it to yourself. You know, as President Teddy Roosevelt said, if you could kick in the rear end the person responsible for problems in your life, you wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. You've done it to yourself. You sinned. You fell short of the glory of God. You did it. You chose it. You knew what was right, and you still chose wrong. You knew better, and you did it anyway. You did wrong. So did I. We've all had. And God paid for it on the cross with Christ. And now he's saying, you can be forgiven if you'll repent. <clears throat> but we have to repent. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's what Jesus said. Luke 13, 3 and Luke 13, 5. He says it twice. Some of the devil's advocates could come up with some cute little slogans. Satan has propagandists. Satan likes to come up with cute little phrases and cute little memory tricks and cute little things to say that are just wrong. There are many paths to one place. Yeah, hell. There are many paths to hell. But as far as heaven, nope, just one way. See, the, the devil likes to have his propagandists come up with cute little things. Oh, yeah. The devil made me do it. Adam made me do it. It's Adam and Eve's fault. I can't help it, you know. There's some people that agree with the doctrine of original sin, right? You got... Satan, these people that Ezekiel's rebuking for their terrible immorality, uh, Augustine, Augustine, excuse me, Calvin, and Lady Gaga, who says she was born that way. But the Bible says you're not born that way. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. You can't go astray unless you were once right. You can't leave God unless you were once with God. And you can't become evil unless you were once not evil. And you can't repent if you've never done right. And we did this to ourselves, and God in his grace has provided a way for us to get out. And we should take it. The only one that's not fair to you is Jesus on the cross, and he willingly went there. Um, the wicked always want to blame someone else for their trouble. Instead of facing their sin and taking responsibility to repent I don't ever want to be convinced that all my sins and all my problems are someone else's fault. Because then I can't simply make a choice to fix it. If sin's my fault, and if I did this to myself, and I have free will, then I can choose God, and I can turn away from it. And I'm in control of my destiny. I can choose God, and I can choose grace, and even though I don't deserve it, I, I can still do it. I can still go to heaven. Whereas if it's all... Somebody, well, then it's up to God or somebody else or some, something else outside of my control. What a terrible, what a terrible thing to believe. What a terrible way to feel. Can you imagine if you didn't have any choice? You were absolutely hopeless. And that's the way a lot of people were. That's the way a lot of people were in this country. They bought into these Calvinistic ideas and they're all across the frontier. They came from these uh, Presbyterian and these Baptist churches that had this Reformed theology and they wanted to follow God, but they never had that experience that told them that God had chosen them. They didn't think they were one of the elect. So they're like, well, if I'm going to go to hell, I might as well go sin. And that's the way they lived. And then good old Walter Scott came along with a five-finger exercise and explained to them that that's not true and showed them that they could choose and the choice was theirs. And they came to Christ in droves. They wanted to be Christians. They just didn't think they could. Because they have never had this experience to show them that they're one of the elect. They're sitting around waiting for a sign from God that wasn't going to come. When really they just needed to choose to follow Jesus. And once they understood that that Calvinistic baloney wasn't true, uh, people just came to Christ by the thousands and thousands. I mean, he was baptizing 3,000 people a year. Because it, bring him out of these lives. And, we, and, and Calvinism has a resurgence today. 
And you think, well, there's really that many Calvinists? Yeah, the whole Southern Baptist denomination. And like, they really believe that? Yeah. Go listen to Charles Stanley lie to people on the radio. I've heard him say, I don't care if you become a murderer or an atheist or, or a rapist. If you believed in Jesus Christ once, you could never lose your salvation no matter what you do. Well, no wonder he left his wife and didn't care. What's the, who can't lose his salvation? Do whatever you want. It's a lie from the devil. Ezekiel 18 says that if a righteous person turns from the righteousness back to sin, all the good they ever did is forgotten. We have to repent regularly. And so uh, their cha the, the charge may have been misunderstood. But the application of Exodus 20, verse 5, Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them, nor serve them. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation who hate me. So notice they only quote verse 5. They don't quote verse 6. And they certainly aren't going to quote this verse. Look at Deuteronomy 24, 16. The father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the father. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Hello? See, but when people want to believe a false lie, they'll ignore certain scriptures and only hone in on that. I see it in politics all the time. I see it with COVID. People only hear what they want to hear. They'll, they'll ignore all the lies, all the contradictions, all the false statements, and they'll listen to, well, they said this. You know, they're telling you, yeah, but how many times has that person lied to you before? You're, you're believing that, that person's still an authority to you? They're making millions of dollars personally off the vaccination that you're taking, and you're believing them? They don't have any ulterior motive? People are just blind. They, they don't see what they don't want to see. And a person who doesn't love the truth and won't look objectively is going to believe whatever lie they want to believe. The devil will give them evidence, and they'll see, they'll say, oh yeah, you inherit your father's sin, Exodus 20, verse 5. And they'll ignore Deuteronomy 24, 16. And they'll ignore Deuteronomy 20, verse 6. The very next verse. They have selective hearing. They ignore Deuteronomy 24, 16 passage, the Exodus 20, verse 6 passage. Evil men make the Bible say whatever they want it to say. It's like the guy who killed himself reading the Bible. He decided he wanted to read it, and he opened it up. Flipped around and put his finger down. And it says, and Judas went out and hung himself and died. Oh, that's unpleasant. So he flipped back a few pages, put his finger down another place. And Jesus said, go ye and do likewise. So he went out and hung himself. That's how some people read the Bible. They like a verse here, a verse there, put them together, and make up something that the Bible does not say. And um, uh, a text out of context is a pretext to a lie. And you have to understand the whole picture, not part of the picture. If you take a verse that says, we're, not, we're saved by faith and not by works of the law, and make that mean, well, baptism isn't a work of the law. That's not even talking about baptism. Well, no, see, we don't need to be baptized because we're saved by faith and not by works of the law. And they ignore James chapter 2, where it says faith without works is dead. And they try to make works of the law equal to baptism, which they're not. And try to make baptism into a work when the Bible says the baptism isn't a work we do. It's a work of the Holy Spirit in us. And they twist and they contort to where you don't need to be baptized anymore. Even though the Bible's so plain about baptism, you'd have to be stuck on stupid to not see it. You have to be professionally educated by a pastor out of believing the truth about baptism. But that happens because they only hear what they want to hear because they're stuck on a doctrine. And so when we don't have selective hearing. These people had selective hearing. They didn't want to own up to their sin. What they did not want to admit is Jerusalem's being destroyed and we're going into captivity and it's nobody's fault but mine. You know, like the old blues song, Blind Lemon Jefferson. Uh, he sang that blues song, nobody's fault but mine. It's nobody's fault but mine. If I end up going to hell, it's nobody's fault but mine. And... Uh, before we take our break, um, I want to encourage you. If you've been blaming other people for who you are, stop it. Your daddy may have ate sour grapes, but if your teeth are on edge, it's because you ate sugar yourself. Your daddy and your mommy didn't make you a sinner. You made that choice.
and you're the one who has to decide to repent. They can't decide for you. You have to, you decide your fate, not them. Let's take a 10 minute break and we'll come back. Okay, I need to pause this. I hope this is working, Jake. <laughs> 